action. action. Okay, so welcome to our third se third session of topics. Third and improved, Omer. as you can see. <laughs> yes, very improved. Look at Omer. He looks like he's in a studio, but he's not. He's at home. Look at him. Yeah, if you can't look at him, it's because... It's because Completely redundant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so as Omer said in the last session, uh, we are getting weirder and weirder, but we also uh, upgrade ourselves every time. I also want to mention that I said in the last session that we will do some demo about ZTNA and authentication and front-end, back-end, but we are not going to do it today. We're going to do something better. We are going to talk about container orchestrators, right? So containers, containers, <laughs> orchestrators. So many right? features, so many yeah. features. So text appears in here, right? Containers orchestrators. And um, next time, or maybe some other session, we'll talk about the front-end, back-end authentication. But today is going to be the containers orchestrators. This is the third topic of topics. All right. Okay. So Omer, yes. just give me some few examples of container orchestrators. So we'll have something to talk about. Okay. Um... Let's start with the most obvious ones, right? So first one that comes into mind is Kubernetes. All right. Second one to me is probably ECS, which is the container orchestrator by AWS. Um, what else? We have all the flavors of the managed Kubernetes uh, platforms, which are GKA, probably- GKE, AKS, you know, Azure. Exactly. Google, so we just AWS. mentioned the one of uh, Google's, Google Clouds, uh, Azure by Microsoft, and then uh, AWS's. Uh, we also have some famous ones like Nomad by HashiCorp, which we can talk on its special benefits mm -hmm. later on. Right. I'm not um, familiar with it, so I'll be glad to hear more about it. I have no idea about Nomad. I mean, I, I played a bit with it, you know, in some tutorial, but I didn't do like a hands-on experience with it. Same here. I can't say I deployed it in production, but I do know the benefits. Um, so I think it, it's worth a shot, at least worth discussing and considering if that's something that anyone's doing right now. Um, those are the main ones, I think. You obviously have Docker Compose, which is a way to uh, formally describe what do you want to do, how do you want to communicate or connect containers one to another by creating networks, disks, volumes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, which I wouldn't call an orchestrator. With it used to be backed by uh, Docker's orchestrator. Swarm. What was it? Swarm. It was correct. Swarm, yeah. I don't know if that's still the case, but yes, that was another one. Uh, there was Mesos in the past and um, probably a few others we missed. I'm assuming Kubernetes is 90 something percent of the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that. Um, all right, so I say let's just talk. Well, when by talk, reminding everyone that we're here to talk about like why would we choose some container orchestrators or why are we doing what we're doing? Okay, that's the most important part here. Like why should we choose, for example, um, a cloud orchestrator rather than deploying ourselves. So I'll just give a very, very quick example. If I have a big application with many services and I want to deploy it so my customers will be able to access this application, what I can do is I can provision, oh, by, we got also a Minikube, right, Omer? Minikube is also like mini, mini Kubernetes, right? So I can provision some virtual machine in the cloud and then bring up Minikube on it and that's it, I have Kubernetes in the cloud, but it's not high availability because I got only one machine and it's not such so a good idea. I would consider that just another flavor of Kubernetes because Kubernetes goes, I mean, you have K3S, which is the lightweight yeah. version and you have mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. So K3S yeah. probably for IoT machines and then you have Kubernetes, which is the normal one and you have uh, Minikube for local deployments. I would consider that more of a local playing tool I mean, right. Minikube uh, to deploy stuff locally and play with it and maybe work against your cluster, same as you would in production or development environment. But yeah, it's an option, definitely. So let's divide it. Let's first talk about scale. Okay, that's the first topic of service of container orchestrators. Like, how would you choose? So let's say I'm like, I'm a startup. I don't have many services, like maybe three, four services. That's it. Okay, don't think more. I know you want more, Omer, but no more. Okay, only three or four services. All right. Okay. What would you choose? How would you go with three or four services? Um, and you're a startup. You need to go as fast as you can, right? You need to deploy it as fast as you can. No time, no time. 
Okay, so let's start by saying that scale uh, basically means two things. If you just um, consider the word, what, it, what does it mean to scale? You have basically scale up and scale out, right? Or in and down, which means either taking the same thing and making it bigger. For example, I have um, an instance with two CPU cores. Scaling up would be replacing that with a, an instance with four CPU cores. Um, whereas scaling out means give me more of the same. I want this instance with two CPU cores, but I want five of these. And then on top of that, you usually use some kind of load balancer that that's what it does, distributes the load um, across those instances, and then you get more capacity to respond to more requests or load or whatever it is. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so scaling out and scaling up, those are your two options. Now, when we come to orchestrators, you have another layer of complexity because it's not only scaling the container up or out, it's also scaling the nodes, yeah. right? Uh, so that's another layer. And for that reason, I usually, my go-to, if there's no nothing special at the moment, let's consider what we talked about last week, which was uh, internal services, right? Yeah. Usually not the, mo not the most uh, production loaded, uh, heavy traffic thing. I would go for spot instances with Fargate. Now let's leave the spot instances aside. I just put <laughs> push something okay. out there. L let's not kill uh, our audience. <laughs> cool. So I would use Fargate. And Fargate is basically serverless for containers, which means you get to run a container orchestrator. That can work, by the way, EKS, ECS, both of them work, but you don't have to manage nodes. I just put containers, and if I want to scale out, instead of one, I want 1,000. I just ask with AWS, assuming that my account allows and the quota and everything is fine. I get 1,000 containers deployed out there in the wild on AWS uh, infrastructure, right? All right. Let's, uh, let's focus on that scale. I like, okay, let's dig in what you just said. Yeah. Uh, we, we always like this double click, right? Yeah. So you said you're, you're going to scale 1,000. Which metric do you usually use to scale? So let's say you have a load balancer and, you know, traffic comes to the application. Which application, do, which metric do you usually choose to scale your services? Uh... So the rule of thumb, if you want to call it, or whatever the default, the easiest one is the CPU. And the reason is, is that CPU is a responsive metric in the way that if you scale, let's say I'm at 60% CPU, which is usually high for whatever uh, service you're running. If you're at CPU, 60% uh, CPU, I'm going to scale out. I'm going to add another instance. And then the CPU will probably drop because I'm looking at an average across all my instances. So it will naturally drop. And if I add more and more and more instances, it will gradually drop. Whereas um, if you rely on something like memory, for example, uh, memory might not drop because if you have a memory leak or the way the application behaves <clears throat> is not a way of uh, using a, a constant garbage collector or something goes wrong, you might end up with an endless loop of scale. So my usually go-to is CPU unless I have <clears throat> a really specific metric to, uh, to count on. I have another uh -huh. question. Another question. Can I ask? Can I ask? Of course. You're the only <laughs> one with questions here, Mayor. Of Yay. course you can ask. <laughs> another question. So what would you say about requests per target? That's also a metric that you can choose. Let's say I got 5K, you know, 5,000 requests per target. If you got that, scale out. And that's because I'm saying, I think, you know, I did low test with JMeter or some other, you know, load, load distribution tools or something like that. And I've realized that my system can handle, like each server can handle 5,000 requests at mm -hmm. a time, or, or may, probably I'll take 60%, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll take something like 4,000 or 3,000 requests per target, and then I'll scale out. What would you say about that? Is that a good metric? Would you use it? Uh, first of all, yeah. Again, depends on what you're serving. If your application is uh, your retail company and that's the, the typical traffic of your uh, clients, yeah, sure. Uh, one thing to comment about what you said, if you were running load tests with something like JMeter and you discovered that a um, single instance can run 5,000 requests or can handle uh, 5,000 requests, don't put that as your metric. I would normally take a rule of thumb of 30% lower mm -hmm. from my peak load to where I would start to scale. And the reason for that is, first of all, you're probably not very accurate with the testing. Uh, and second of all, scaling might take time, especially with things like Fargate, right? Before we started the session, you mentioned that you were kind of concerned about Fargate because it sometimes uh, takes a while to, to work or to respond. 
Comparing uh, to I, Kubernetes, you know, let's be fair with the uh, with AWS. Comparing to Kubernetes, like running on Kubernetes natively, it spawns like Kubernetes spawns containers faster. Like in my experience, than and and that's natural. And that's natural because when you're running your own EC2 instances, that obviously is your infrastructure is there is just waiting to launch another container, and the only thing you're waiting for, the only latency is how long does it take for me to take to tell the Docker agent or Kubelet or whatever it is to spawn another instance. Whereas if I use um, Fargate, you're basically uh, sending a request to AWS as a platform, telling them I need another container, and then they need to provision something and put it there and allocate memory and CPU, etc. It takes more time. Uh, mm-hmm. That said, I did have issues with ECS in the but I'm talking about five, six, seven years. It has improved a lot. Uh, I don't think I encountered any problems with provisioning. It's not blazingly fast like the others uh as as in a native one but it works pretty well never had issues especially when we grow to large numbers you you always think of this in the in the small numbers area what happens if i only have one or two instances and i need another one that would take time but usually when you grow when you're talking about hundreds let alone thousands of instances Mm -hmm. it it falls in i mean you don't notice it it just grows naturally and shrinks back Makes sense, makes sense. So I yeah. say let's try to move on to another topic, right? So another topic that we can talk about is, y- you mentioned it, it's also in the scaling area, I would say. I, I would call it like the node management, okay? And by node management, um, uh, it's in the scaling area, all right? So do you have any tools that you're using or services to scale according to the containers? So we talked about, you know, scaling according to the requests of the load balancer and to CPU and to memory. So usually uh, scale your nodes, how? You're saying like uh, if you got maybe uh, me- memory requests, memory limits, right? We, you have those, um, me- not metrics, like definitions for containers right. that you can define and right. according to that scale. How, how do you usually do that? Can you talk about it? Uh, sure. So a few years ago when I was uh, heavily working only with ECS, I wanted to achieve exactly that, to scale node. Fargate wasn't even an option. It wasn't a thing. And the only way you could run is using your own nodes. And that was the problem. There, I mean, you could run an auto scaling group and let it, uh, I don't know, scale by one of the metrics you just mentioned, but there wasn't like a perfect way to do that, let alone scale back. Um, I kind of wrote a project, if you will, which is basically a Lambda running in the cloud, triggering every, I don't know, minute or hour. I can't even remember. Uh, it's open source, by the way, on my GitHub, we'll and it's the still there. Below. We'll definitely yeah, it. it's called ECS Scale. Mm-hmm. You don't need it anymore. I'll explain why in a minute. But what that used to do is basically look at a couple of metrics and then make decisions uh, based on CPU, memory, how many instances do I want to run? Are there any containers waiting to be deployed? And maybe they can't because, you know, when you're running containers or nodes, um, you're requesting some kind of a resource allocation, which might be memory or CPU. And if I'm a big uh, instance of an application, and I'm asking for four cores and there are only three available in the node, I can't run. So either I'm waiting for another node to join the cluster um, or I'm just hanging or in a failed state or whatever. Uh, so that's what my project used to do. Since then, Amazon created their own uh, scaling platform. They can kind of do it for you today. Um, and in Kubernetes, I think that would be Carpenter, if I'm not mistaking, yeah, that can handle Carpenter that for with, you. Um, like for the runners that I'm using, the GitHub Actions controller with Carpenter, it's amazing. So Carpenter is amazing for scaling nodes. You know, it's crazy. Can you, you expand on target, that a little bit? You just just set the target, say like uh, you want to have, you can say I want to have 60% CPU or I need this numbers of machines and it does everything for you. You just need mm-hmm. to tell it what you want, you know, um, like the requirements, you need to be up to, like, uh, as I said, a, a percentage of, so- of something or a count of something, and it will provision the nodes accordingly. And you can tell it, I want to have the, these node, node groups, you know, node families. Like I need C6, uh, I, C6, uh, N, D, you know, all those no- com- com- computing nodes. And it will provision them automatically and scale it up, um, out, and down automatically. You know, it's crazy. Perfect. And, and so, to be even uh, more precise, scale out mm-hmm. and scale in. You know, I, sc- I said uh, out and uh, down. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, um, so Carpenter is amazing. So just uh, if, if I can zoom back to our line of conversation, we were uh, talking about 
what platform would you use in which case, right? Mm -hmm. So if in the past, still is, Fargate is an amazing platform and you can use it for everything. If you still have a reason to use your own nodes and a reason might not be something very complex. Uh, it can be, I want to save money. Uh, I want the accessibility. I want the lowest latency, whatever it may be. Uh, you can run your own nodes and today with solutions like uh, the scaler, AWS scaler or Carpenter for Kubernetes or tons of other projects out there, you can basically achieve the same. It would require some work. When you go to Fargate, scale is automatic. Um, when you go, I mean, automatic in the sense that you don't really need to manage nodes, right? You do have to consider or configure your own container uh, scale, but you don't have any nodes. So that's not up to you. You don't care about it. Whereas if you run your own, you do need to kind of at least consider that, maybe activate something or install something in Kubernetes's case. Uh, so that's something to think about. <clears throat> I would usually go, especially for internal services, especially for things that I know for the ECS on Fargate, because they work uh, perfectly well together. Um, reasons to go to Kubernetes would be one, I guess, being very familiar with the platform because that's what everyone are using and probably pluggability because uh, <clears throat> Kubernetes has such a big community around it that you have um, Helm for packaging and installing third party. I was about party. to ask you if there's something like Helm to uh, ECS. I'm not familiar with something. I'm, I'm like not that. sure. I don't Package think there is. Maybe ECS. there is. I'm not sure. Um, right? Surely nothing is easy as to set up EKS on AWS and just write Helm install MySQL or Helm install Redis or Helm install whatever it is. And you have an mm. elastic cluster running in the cloud. Simple as that. Um, so I think that's a great reason to use Kubernetes on the other I agree. hand. Um, uh, okay, so we got like uh, every time we want to make it shorter, but every time the session gets longer. So we'll definitely split this session because we can talk for hours about this. I'm session. actually happy with that, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to, to split this session for another one where we'll keep talking about container orchestrators because it's like it's a huge topic, but this time we are actually going to keep talking about it. Unlike the, the last session where we said we we're going to do something this time, we actually going to do it. And, right. the, and, and hopefully the recording will get better like it did now. And uh, Omer, conclusions for this session. So like in a few words saying, like talking about, I don't know, ECS, Fargate, a word, Kubernetes, a word, and that's it. Yeah, I have this uh, constant line that I keep saying, maybe it's just me. Um, the thing is, don't just jump on the technology that everyone are using. In this case, Kubernetes. Kubernetes is great. It's an amazing platform. It's pluggable. You have a huge community. It's amazing. It isn't necessarily the thing you need. If you're running uh, an application or two with a little backend and a, and a, I don't know, Postgres database, you might just go as well with an EC2 instance or Docker Composer, which just do a little research, understand what works for you. Uh, again, my go-to ECS with a few Fargate containers and that's it. Simple as that. It's the easiest thing on earth, literally. Whereas setting a Kubernetes cluster is a, it might be a hard thing if you don't know it and it's probably an overkill for a lot of application. So just consider that. Uh, I don't think we mentioned, and that's uh, another topic for another session, but you also have serverless, which is not a container orchestrator, but it's another way to kind of set up the same thing in the cloud. We can speak about functions on another time. Great, great, great. So thank you and uh, Omer, see you next time. Yep, see you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye for now. Bye-bye.